Hi, my name is Yin Gao and welcome to Dr. Gao's classroom. I'm a professional philosopher and I love classical Chinese poetry. I have been translating classical Chinese poetry with a colleague of mine for the last three years and I would love to share my knowledge on the subject with you. This is the second video on the Tang poet Li Bai and if you'd like to know more about Li Bai's life, please check the first part of the video in my channel. If you like the contents of my channel, please subscribe my channel. Your enjoyment is my command. Before I go on to talk about Li Bai's poem, I would like to talk a little bit about the poetic tradition of Chinese scholar officials. These scholar officials often grow up by memorizing Confucian texts and they were often committed to Confucian values, such as being loyal to the emperor and have deep concern about the suffering of the common people, providing sagely counsels for the emperor, build a Confucian paradise with the emperor if they could. However, Li Bai is an exception. Although he paid the lip service to these values, his real goal were political power or immortality. Studied Taoist texts and martial art since very young, Li Bai was an accomplished swordsman and truly believed that by practicing Taoism, one was able to achieve immortality. These two opposing goals had been tormenting him all his life. If he pursued political power, he would not be able to retreat to the mountain to practice Taoism and achieve immortality. If he pursued immortality, he might have to let go of his political ambition. So his appreciation of the carefree lifestyle of the knight errant was perhaps a compromise between these two opposing ambition. Because a knight errant could practice Taoism and achieve immortality, will also make great military achievement when they were needed by the emperor, hence gain political power. Let me read this poem. Ji Zhu Yan Mei Jiu, Jian Ge Yi Sui Mei, Jing Guo Yan Tai Zi, Jie Tuo Bing Zhou Er, Sao Nian Fu Zhuang Qi, Fen Lie Zi Yu Shi, Yin Ji Lu Gou Jian, Zeng Bo Wu Xiang Qi. Let's look at the first two couplets. Ji Zhu Yan Mei Jiu, Ji is play or hit the string, Zhu is an ancient musical instrument. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Yin is drink, Mei Jiu is fine wine, and Jian Ge Yi Sui Mei, Jian is sword, and Ge is sing, Yi Sui is the river Yi, uh, Mei is the bank of the river. So translate the first couplet, it reads, playing the zither and drinking fine wine. Jin Ke sang a song twining his salt by the Yi River. And the second couplet, Jin Guo Yan Tai Zi. Jin is experience, Guo is socializing or associate with, Yan is the state of the warring period time, and Tai Zi is crown prince. Jie Tuo Bing Zhou Er, Jie Tuo is become friends, and Bing Zhou is a state, Bing state, and Er is the young man. So translate the second couplet, it reads, Jin Ke hang out with the crown prince of Yan, and befriended with the knight errant from the Bing state. This is a reproduction of the musical instrument. Okay, now, uh, the first couple is allure to an event happened towards the end of the Warring State period in 2027 BC, six years before the King of Qin united the whole China and claimed himself as the first emperor in 2021. So by 2027, the King of Qin had taken over four kingdoms out of the seven existing kingdoms, including the Qin itself. It was apparent to the remaining two kingdoms, the kingdom of Yan and Qi, that the Qin could attack them at any given time. 
So the aristocrats of the Sixth Kingdom had plotted many assassinations against the king of Qin, but all failed. The story in this poem is just another failed attempt. It goes something like this. The crown prince of Yan hired a hit man named Jin Ke to assassinate the king of Qin. Jin Ke needed an assistant to carry out the mission and had sent one of his fellow warriors to come and join him. However, as the Qin army advanced towards the border of the Yan, the crown prince was growing more and more impatient and would like to carry out the assassination as soon as possible. After many pleadings by the prince, Jin Ke agreed to go ahead with the mission. But Jin Ke also knew that the assistant assigned by the prince was probably not up to the task, and he might not be able to carry out the mission and come out alive. So on the day of the departure, Jin Ke's friends held a farewell party for him. The friend played the zither and Jin Ke sing a song, twining his thoughts. Here's the lyrics of the song. Feng xiao xiao xi yi shui han, zhuang shi yi qu xi bu fu huan. So feng is wind, xiao xiao is the sound of the wind, so like a swoosh. And xi is a accelerate word, and yi shui of course is the yi river, and han is cold. Zhuang shi yi qu xi bu fu huan. So Zhuang Shi is the warrior or a strong warrior. Yi Qu is a, a departure, like a departed. And Xi is accelerate word again. And Bu is a not or no. And Fu Huan is return. So it translates as the wind swashes and the Yi River is cold. The warrior is departing but will not return. By alluring to the Jin Ke story, Li Bai was praising the young knight errant being as courageous as Jin Ke. The second couplet also mentioned Jin Ke's association with the crown prince, implying the young knight errant was well connected. Like Jin Ke, he hangs out with the princes and befriended with other knight errants from the Bing. The knight errant from Bing were also known for their loyalty and excellent swordsmanship. The phrase of a young man from Bing, or Bing Zhou Er, is an abbreviation of knight errant from the Bing, or Bing Zhou Yu Xia Er. The knight errant from Bing first appeared in a poem by a prince from the Three Kingdom period, Cao Zi, by the title of A Ballad of White Horse, or Bai Ma Pian. In this poem, the knight errant were praised for their loyalty, excellent swordsmanship, and their military achievement. The most known knight errants of Bing during the Tang Dynasty were the ones fought alongside with the founding father of the dynasty, Li Yuan. Even at Li Bai's time, about a hundred years later, young warriors from Bing were still admired immensely. For the young man to be friended with them suddenly shows that he was as loyal and excellent a swordsman as them. Now let's look at the last two couplets. Xiao Nian Fu Zhuang Qi, Fen Lie Zi Yu Shi. So Xiao Nian is young man, Fu is carry or harbor something, and Zhuang Qi is actually two characters that put together to represent strings or courage, or ambition. And Fen Lie Zi Yu Shi, Fen is spreading the wing and soar into the sky, and Lie is being ardent about something. And Zi is naturally, and Yu Shi is there is time, or there will be time. So when you put these two together, uh, two lines together, it can be translated as the young knight errant harbors strong ambition. There will be time for him to rise high and be ardent. The last couplet reads, Yin Ji Lu Go Jian, Zheng Bo Wu Xiang Qi. So Yin is due to or when, 
and Ji, of course, is a hit. And Lu Goujian, so Goujian is a name of a Asian warrior from the Warring State period, is a contemporary of Jin Ke. And he's from Lu, so it's called Lu Goujian. And Zheng Bo Wu Xiang Qi, Zheng is compete, Bo is a, um, a game or gamble game, um, and Wu is a don't or do not. Um, Xiang is uh, like uh, each other or uh, with each other, and Qi is like uh, insult. So when you put these two lines together, it can be translated when playing pitch pot with someone like Gao Jian from Lu, don't insult each other and fighting over a game. The last two couplets start with an accomplishment on the young man's strings ambition and his ardent attitude on taking actions. Yet, the poem concludes with a caution on this attitude by praising Jin Ke's reaction to a fight with Gou Jian. According to legend, Jin Ke and Gou Jian once got into an argument over a game. Gou Jian insulted Jin Ke by yelling at him. Instead of getting into a fight with Gou Jian to defend his honor as a knight errant, Jin Ke left without saying anything, and the people witnessed this, including Gou Jian, took this as a covert act on Jin Ke's part. But later, when Gou Jian heard of Jin Ke's courageous attempt to assassinate the king of Qin, Gou Jian regretted that he mistreated Jin Ke, lamenting, how badly did I misjudge this person in the past? So Jinke was not regarded as a terrorist because he was trying to stop a tyrant invading his own country. His action was highly regarded by the nobles from all the defeated countries as heroic. So by praising the courage and loyalty of Jinke, Li Bai implied that the young knight errant is a courageous and loyal warrior. But he cautioned the young man to not risking his life even when his reputation was at stake, showing that Li Bai deeply cared about this young man. In the first part of this talk, I mentioned Li Bai's young friend Du Fu, who is an equally important poet in Chinese poetic tradition. But I'm not going to talk about Du Fu because BBC has published a documentary on Du Fu. So I listed the link below. The document does a wonderful job exploring Du Fu's poetry, but just briefly mentioned Li Bai and Du Fu's friendship without much detail. So I'm going to talk about the nature of their friendship and the poem that they sent to each other. If you're interested in knowing more about Li Bai and Du Fu, please check in next week. You can also view my other videos by subscribing my channel. Or if you're interested in Chinese literature or would like to read more poetry or any other texts on Chinese philosophy or traditional Chinese medicine, please contact me. I listed my email address below. Otherwise, thanks for listening to my talk and hopefully I'll see you next week.